morning to everyone uh, our speaker for today is dr s girish he has an experience of 33 years in tech in teaching consultancy and research and is presently working as professor in department of civil engineering in bms college of engineering bangalore uh, our speaker has completed his bachelor of engineering in civil engineering from national institute of engineering mysore university and has completed his master of engineering in structural engineering from bangalore university in 1988 He has worked as, as he has worked on self concreting uh, for a doctoral work on video belgram on influencing of powder and paste on fresh and hardening properties of self compacting concrete in 2010. A speaker has published research papers in various national and international journals and in conferences and is exceeding more than 40. He has presented papers in abroad several times, especially in Rilam conference in Bel. their conference belgium and canada paris fans and other conferences in hong kong our speaker has res- uh, has a recipient of state academy award for four times from karnataka council of science and technology for the best project in the year 2009 11 13 and 15 and institutional level sponsored by tata consultancy for innovation innovation in the year 2017 and 19 he has successfully supervised two research scholars for the doctoral work and currently supervising one international research scholar and four indian research scholars for the doctoral work he has guided more than 80 undergraduate and 40 postgraduate students he is in the review of many journals some of them are construction of building materials the indian concrete journals and the journal of civil engineering He is recognized as an active member in the Relam Committee on Rheology of Concrete-Based Composites. His research interests include self-compacting concrete, rheology of fresh concrete, recycling of marginal material, bacterial concrete, previous concrete, geopolymer concrete, and structural health monitoring. We welcome you, sir, on behalf of CMIT. Over to the speaker. Thank you, Bhuvan. Oh, to speak. Okay, thank you, sir. Good morning, one and all. I hope uh, you are all safe uh, and healthy in this uh, difficult situation. Before I start, uh, I take this opportunity to thank Rasta Center for Road Technology, Bangalore, give, for giving me an opportunity to be part of this webinar. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ajay N and uh, Professor Ashwin M Joshi. coordinators of this webinar also i would like to thank uh, mr ashok kumar of cmti construction management training institute for anchoring this webinar thank you sir okay so before uh, i present the uh, slides let me confess that uh, i am giving an overall uh, view on rheological properties of fresh concrete um, for from indian condition or indian perspective this topic itself is new for india and as such my slides are more of academic uh, flavor rather than uh, uh, high fi presentation so as such uh, some of the slides maybe you you may be aware of that basic fundamentals which uh, i'd like to emphasize before going in for rheology of concrete so let me start with this uh, um, first slide the this is outline of my presentation where i'll be touching upon the introduction where i'd like to say the transformation that the concrete has taken place in about 100 years maybe 100 or 120 years and then more so on limitations of the empirical test in particular the slump test some information on rheology of fresh concrete why we need this and what are the models that is available to measure rheological properties of concrete and what are the instruments that is available to measure this and finally uh i have mentioned as concluding remark i don't want to say it is a concluding remark so we cannot conclude on this i can say take home message that what you can have at the end of this session so let us come to this transformation of concrete when i am talking about the transformation of concrete i am just looking at uh, 120 years old from the day abraham introduced this con- concept of abraham's law or the slump test for measuring the workability when we look at this initially concrete can be treated as four ingredient concrete today we can take concrete as a multiple ingredients so basically concrete has cement sand gravel and then water today we are talking in terms of additional um, ingredients like supplementary cementitious material or i can generalize as uh, mineral admixtures 
and also the chemical infectious. So in addition to four, we are today in a domain where at least six ingredients has to be there for concrete. So in other words, we can say multiple ingredients has taken over the concrete there. When we come to this mineral admixture itself, there are a lot of other materials are there. We can generalize that as a mineral admixture or a filler. It can, it can be inert, it can be active, it can be fly ash, it can be silica film, it can be GGBS, anything that we can look into. In fact, uh, um, many a times uh, um, the information is that it is considered as a waste material. For example, if I take fly ash or GGBS, it is considered as a waste material. But I'm sorry to say that uh, no longer we should call it as a waste material because the tremendous advantages that we have in using these uh, mineral admixture are plenty. In fact, uh, today we are in a domain where we can say if somebody were to do a concrete without mineral admixture, it's, it has to be um, just rejected. In addition to that, the chemical admixture, the water reducer or a plasticizer or a suplasticizer or a retard or any other uh, thing, we can generalize that. So as such, the two important uh, uh, ingredients have joined the concrete in addition to the four mineral as well as a chemical mixture because of that lot of transformation has taken place in concrete. So as such, from basic four ingredients concrete to multiple ingredients that what we see today. That's one thing. Let us go to the next point that what we see in the transformation of concrete. From normal concrete to special concrete. So when we talk about uh, normal concrete, again it is again the four ingredient concept. From then, it has come to today, advanced concrete or special concrete. You can name anything. I listed only four of them. High strength concrete, high performance concrete, fiber reinforced concrete, self-compacting concrete. Like that, many concretes have taken their birth. This is because of two important uh, ingredients, that is mineral admixture and chemical admixture. Without them, today we not have called it as special or advanced type of concrete. As such, from normal concrete, or we can call it as a conventional concrete or vibrated concrete to special concrete where we can talk in terms of SEC, where it is a flowing concrete or self-consolidating concrete. So a lot of transformation has taken place as such from the view of a normal concrete to special concrete, a lot of changes have taken place, a lot of properties have been changed, a lot of uh, um, things that we need to look into for the concrete mix design and so on and so forth. So as such, the second transformation that has taken place in concrete is that from normal concrete to an advanced or a special type of concrete has taken place. The third transformation that uh, I can put it as is the use of chemical admixture, plasticizers. In fact, uh, from plasticizers, we are talking in terms of uh, super plasticizer. Some other commercial uh, names that we can look into is a hyperplasticizer. So the chemical admixture, a lot of chemical admixtures there in that the prominent one is a water reducer, a high range water reducers. That's what I'm speaking. In addition to that, retarder is also to some extent it plays a role. Whereas other things like isolators and other things are only specific to a requirement where we are not talking about that. So as such, the third transformation that concrete has taken place or the nature of the concrete has taken place is because of the introduction of the chemical admixtures there. Chemical admixture, in particular, the superplasticizers, where in uh, previously about 30, 40 years, we talk in terms of the naphthalene base, melamine base, where the base of the superplasticizer will dictate the terms. Today, we are talking in, in terms of polycarbolic ether based uh, uh, plasticizers or superplasticizers, where a lot of changes has taken place. So, commercially, sometimes they, uh, commercial people, they call it as first generation, second generation, third generation, and they give a new name, hyperplasticizer, and call it as a fourth generation. Whatever may be said and done, one thing that from an academic point of view is that it is a high range water reducer where we can look into electrostatic repulsion as well as a steric hindrance that uh, is going to impact your concrete there. The electrostatic repulsion is uh, uh, when we have this SP subplaster uh, introduced into the water, it has got a negative charge. This negative charge adsorbs onto the cement particles when it uh, when it adsorbs onto the second particles which flocculate because of the fineness, it opens out, it releases the water there. In addition to that, the third generation or the PCE based admixtures, they also do steric hindrance, that is physically they separate out the cement particles there. As such, today when we are talking in terms of a uh, super processor based on uh, steric hindrance, the effectiveness is much more than your previously naphthalene or melamine based uh, plasticizers. That's a third uh, thing that we can look into. As such, I can put it at this stage that the two important contribution that we have got as far as the transformation of concrete is the introduction of mineral admixture 
then introduction of your chemical admissions there. Without these two, we would not have seen the second slide where I've shown that it's high strength concrete, high performance concrete, fiber reinforcement, I'm sorry, uh, self-compacting concrete. The third thing that is contributed for the concrete is of course the introduction of the fibers to make it more ductile. As such, three important things that contribute for the transformation of the concrete. One is the introduction of the mineral admixture. Second one is the introduction of the chemical admixture there. Third one is the introduction of the fibers, any type of fibers, that's not an issue to make it more ductile. So these three, contributes for the concrete and today we are looking at that whatever the transformation has taken place is because of these three. So third thing that can take place is the introduction of chemical admission. So at this point of time I'd like to put one um, observation made by Abdul, uh, Abdul Noor in 1984 in USA conference. He made a bold statement in one of the uh, proceedings. In the world of modern concrete, flash is as essential an ingredient of the mixture as Portland cement, aggregates, water, chemical admixtures. In most concrete, I use it in large amounts, of course he is referring to flash, than the Portland cement and therefore it is not an admixture, an addition to the mixture. Concrete without flash and chemical admixtures should only be found in museum showcases. This is a fascinating observation made in 1984 in one of the concrete conference in USA. This very clearly says that in 1984 itself, if you are doing a concrete with four ingredients of your cement, FA, CA and then water, it has no value. You need to make use of the mineral admixture as well as the chemical admixtures to make it more uh, uh, economical, more stronger, more durable or whatever it is. So in other words, if you are ignorant of the addition of the fifth ingredient and then the sixth ingredient, that type of concrete should be discarded. This is observation made in 1984. Today we are in, the, in 2020. You can imagine that what should be the transformation must have taken place from 1984 to 2020. So as such, today I can put it with due uh, apologies that concrete is just like large Shiva. It can take anything. Only thing is we need to know what are the things that we are supposed to use it for concrete so that we get the best result. So as such, the transformation that has taken place in concrete is tremendous. Let us get into some of the ingredients there. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'd like to point out that we are, even today we refer that as mineral admixture. I'd like to say it is an ingredient. Let us not call it an admixture. We call it as one of the part of the um, composition for the concrete. We call it as mineral, uh, fly ash or GGBS or your SP as a ingredient, not as an admixture. Coming to the fourth point, a lot of uh, materials uh, um, has taken over. For example, earlier we were using natural aggregates. For example, if you talk in terms of the sand or the fine aggregate, it is a river sand. Even our days, we used to use only the uh, uh, natural uh, river sand, but today it is not the case. Today we can look into any type of uh, 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 fine aggregate or coarse aggregate. It can be manufactured and of course again it is from the nature that they take out this. It can be recycled, that's another important domain that which is catching the world. It can be artificial aggregates, sintered fly ash and other things. It can be any waste material or marginal materials that is there in the um, domain that we can use. So as such today when we talk about the basic ingredients of four, the transformation has taken place both in FA as well as in CA. As such, a lot of materials we are going to use it as an FA, a lot of materials we are going to use it as a CA. And not necessarily that these materials should be in comparison with the natural river sand that what we are using earlier or the crushed uh, granite uh, that what we are using as a coarse aggregate. There. So the fourth transformation has taken place in concrete is the use of different types of materials both for FA as well as CA. Then coming to the compaction, earlier we were using rotting, then the tamping then using a vibrator, then we go for self-compacting concrete where we don't require the compaction. As such, when we look at the transformation that has taken place in compaction itself, from the stage where the rotting has given to tamping, tamping to using a vibrator, need wiper or any other surface vibrators, today we are in the domain of self-compacting concrete where we don't require any vibrators, vibration. It is self compact on its own, it will consolidate. And when we talk about this, the transformation from a rotting to no compaction, tremendous things has changed, changed from normal concrete to ACC. Today, we can confidently say that 
ACC, you can use it and then don't leave it, leave the vibration part of it. A lot of issues are there as far as the vibration is concerned. When we talk about the vibrators, for example, your vibrator, when you vibrate, over vibrate, you have problems. When you vibrate at a particular point, it may not be homogeneous material after that. A lot of issues are there. But today we are talking in terms of self-compacting concrete or self-leveling uh, concrete, self-compacting concrete, where we don't require the vibration there or the con consolidation there or any external energy that we are supposed to import for compaction. So as such, today we can get a concrete which is better when compared to the previous one where homogeneous wise uh, better concrete that we can get at least property wise we can get a better enhanced property when compared to rotting and other things so as such in case of self-compacting concrete again the question will come what are the ingredients that we are supposed to use same old ingredients not what we were using for normal concrete the same cement same water same fa same ca except that two additional um, ingredients like mineral admixture and then the chemical admixture are a must for getting the flow for self-compacting concrete. As such, the materials that what we use for ACC, which can be considered as a special concrete or an advanced concrete, is the same thing what is available in and around us. So as such, only thing is we need to reframe or refine that particular mix design to get these properties there. There are a lot of advantages are there in ACC, which I don't want to go at this point of time. Let us come to some more points. So we are in the domain where earlier we were using OPC, ordinary Portland cement. Then Portland Barcelona cement has come into picture, slag cement has come into picture. In other words, the cement wise from OPC, we are seeing a lot of different types of cements that are coming into the market. And if you look at some of the statistics that is available in the domain, almost OPC is uh, likely to go off because roughly about 70, so 30 to 35 percent is only is manufactured OPC. Always now it is PPC. Whenever if you go to any market, they only look at PPC. If you want to get OPC, you need to order for that particular thing. That's what uh, the experience that what we have. And the data that we have got it from the cement industry is that roughly about 70 percent is nothing but your PPC. As such, slowly the OPC is giving away to PPC because of its advantages. Coming to this uh, method of production, ordinary to mechanized. So earlier we used to see a lot of people that in around making noises to do the concreting, but today it is not so. Mechanized thing has come as such. A lot of changes has taken place in the method of production. Earlier we were using a stiff, then medium flowing. Now it is self-compacting concrete. So as such, a lot of transformation is taking place even in the flowability of the concrete. One can look into flowing concrete, one can look into self-consolidating concrete. As such, the thing that was there from stiff to flowing, a lot of changes has taken place. And uh, use of mineral admixture, use of mineral uh, um, ingredient, ingredients, flash and GGBS, yes, it's quite common that those are the two common things that comes out every time whenever we talk about mineral admixture. Of course, there are a lot of other things like silica fume and other things are there, but we talk only about flash and GGBS because of the availability that what we have. And then site mix to RMC. Earlier, a lot of uh, people used to be there around the site, whereas we need, we have changed over to ready mix concrete. And uh, as such, uh, when we go for a ready mix concrete, we have a better control over the property of the concrete. Of course, I'm not going to the uh, deficiencies of the RMCs uh, somebody talks, but let us look into if we can do a good concreting, definitely we have got a better control over RMC uh, concrete there. From ordinary building to high-rise building. Today we are in the era where uh, ordinary building or one-story building is gone. It's a history. Now we are looking at high-rise buildings there. As such, a lot of changes has taken place from the as far as the buildings are concerned, from high-rise to um, uh, from ordinary buildings to high-rise buildings. Shape from simple to complicated. You can imagine any type of shape. Today we are in a position to do the concreting for that. That's ACC can take care of that particular thing. Earlier, it was not the case wherein shape was an issue. But today, shape, any complex shape, no issues, we can manage the concreting there. So from simple to complicated shapes, we can manage or the transformation has taken place. Earlier, we are talking only in terms of 28 days compressive strength. Today, we are talking specific to the requirement or the field requirement. We are talking in terms of fast track construction where we may require the strength at the end of uh, 10 hours, at the end of 24 hours, at the end of 36 hours, like that. So from 28 days to tailor-made strength is what the thing that is happening today. From sp sparingly reinforced to congested reinforced sections. So earlier, uh, when we are looking at the uh, working stress method, of course, invariably those uh, design based on working stress method used to result in uh, heavy sections, whereas today, 
we are looking at limit state is an asset it results in narrow sections and invariably especially for example beam column junction where there is a congestion of reinforcement as such from a sparingly reinforced section to congested reinforcement is a common thing today new design requirements from the old concept of working system um, limit state yes a lot of changes have taken place multiple design methods yes larger section to slender section yes so these are the changes that is taking place both in the design as well as in concreting as such when we look at the transformation of concrete even today when we talk about conventional concrete it is four ingredient concrete but when we look at the ground realities or the ground zero situation lot of changes has taken place as far as the concrete composition is concerned as far as the design is concerned or as far as the method of production and other things are concerned so to put it in a nutshell mix composition has changed mix ingredients has changed natural aggregates have changed performance is the uh, various performance are required or performance specifics are changed strength requirement has changed when we talk about the strength we talk m20 even is 456 2000 where design uh, code for your rcc talks about m20 of course it is under revision shortly we are going to see in maybe another one year we talk in terms of m20 as a basic uh, grade of concrete but when we use this mineral admixture chemical admixture in the laboratory m70 m80 is a common thing that what we see in the laboratory today so the domain of m20 has gone m20 is nothing any any mixture any combination any economical cement uh, that you can use we can get it that's not an issue so as such strength has changed from 20 to somewhere else stiff to flowing yes we have seen that ordinary to extraordinary yes compaction methods have changed addition of multiple ingredients have been seen ordinary to high rise buildings we have seen complex shapes we have seen big to slender sections we have seen working stress limit state as we have seen ground level to high rise and many more so as such when we look at the transformation of the concrete and the design and the production is concerned lot of changes has taken place and the question that comes here are we in a position to change our concept of measuring the concrete workability are we in a position to change that also that's the main question that comes here lot of changes is taking place nobody can deny this let us look into what are the test methods that we have or um, what were the test methods that we still adopt for measuring the workability before that let us go to the fresh concrete concrete behavior is complex yes it is heterogeneous material we don't get a uniform thing with most important time dependent property thick sort of effect is a common thing in concrete so it depends on the time and use of wide range of materials plenty of materials we can use today not an issue still one concept has not changed that is the importance of fresh property so whatever that was importance was given during about 100 years back so same potency is there even today so importance is given for the fresh concrete because whatever the uh, fresh property is there the resulting hardened property is based on the fresh property is there so as such the workability of fresh concrete that is the ease with which it can be transported placed consolidated and finished is a critical property i will put it as this it's a critical property that has a direct impact on the strength durability appearance and most importantly on the cost of the concrete as such the importance of fresh properties cannot be ruled out because it has got a direct impact on many properties of the hardened properties of the concrete and also the cost of the concrete there so let us look into some of the well known definitions this is the american concrete is aci that property of freshly mixed uh, concrete or mortar that determines the ease with which it can be mixed placed consolidated and finished to a homogeneous condition more or less is is also the same thing that property of freshly mixed concrete or mortar which determines the ease and homogeneity with which it can be mixed placed compacted and finished so what we are talking in terms of the definition is a vague definition wherein if a concrete can exhibit this much fine it is accepted so in other words we can attribute this to four things one is a stability it makes should be stable not segregate during uh, transport and placing and mobility it should be cohesive and mobile enough to flow around the reinforcement and cast into the required shape of the form work it should be easily compactable and also it should be able to finish or satisfactory surface finish so when we talk about this i have put some other photographs on the right hand side you can look at the last one where you can see the complex nature of the bench that is there in a park and also the finishing that we can get in case of your cc 
As such, the requirement of stability, mobility, compatibility, and finishability, which is a common thing for normal concrete as well as other concretes, one can look at the, the thing that what we can get by using the special concretes there. So workability of yesterday, today, and future. So monitoring of workability was recognized from the early 20th century to ensure that concrete can be properly placed and can achieve the adequate hardened strength, of course. Presently, the advent of the new so-called high-performance concrete, high-performance concrete mixes that are susceptible to small changes in mix proportion has made the monitoring of the workability even more critical. So the question that comes here is that, yeah, previously workability was an issue for fresh concrete. What about today? Yes, present day also workability is more critical now. Because, for example, if I take SEC, if there is a variation in the water by, let us say, about 10 liters, a lot of changes takes place and it is vulnerable for segregation and bleeding. And in other words, uh, the mix cannot be used. Whereas the same thing, if I look at the normal concrete, where we never use the mineral admixture and chemical admixture, slight variation can, it can tolerate. So as such, presently for the advanced concrete or the special concrete, the workability is more required than the previous one. What are the future? Definitely still more critical. Um, that's my personal thing. And of course, the, for measurement of workability, there are many 67 tests are there where uh, um, we can use these tests to measure the workability of concrete or the fresh concrete. Among this, of course, Slum test is the one which is commonly used or which is commonly known. I listed at some of the um, um, to, to tests that is available for measuring the workability. And this is again some of the tests based on time. For example, a VB consistometer, where it is a remoting concept, where it depends on the time. Based on the distance, the slum test, and then other factors based on the work, it is compaction factor test. Let us look into the slum test. Okay. It is almost 120 years. I put it as 100, even 120 years old. It is incorporated in most codes and guidelines world over. Yes, definitely. It is the one of the oldest tests that we have even today. And it is accepted by many of the codes or the guidelines world over. Even uh, our IS 10262, the mixed design for uh, concrete is uh, from compaction factors which go over to the slum test in 2009 publication. Yes, whether it is American code or British code, Indian code, yes, slum test is the one which is the test for to measuring the workability. And most of the specification they to tell in terms of slum values only. So for example, if I want to have a specification, I quote that specification with slum should be 100 mm or 125 mm or 50 mm. That's the one. So in other words, when we look at all these things, the transformation that is concrete has taken place and the test methods, the transformation must have taken place in concrete. But the test method that is used for measuring the workability still remains the same, the slum test world over. It has gone into the codes, it has gone into the guidelines, it has gone into the specifications also. As such, it is a one test which is more or less is accepted worldwide. Because it is very simple, very simple to uh, conduct the test, inexpensive, doesn't call for any cost, nominal cost to be um, uh, invested for the Abrams comb. Immediate results, that's more important, directly we can get the results. It doesn't require any analysis. Instrument is very light. Somebody can take it comfortably. Operator can manage with limited exposure. It doesn't require any skilled uh, exposure. Anybody can do this. Not much of accessories used for different types of concrete, whether you talk in terms of SEC, whether you talk in terms of normal concrete, whether you talk into fiber reinforced concrete. Yes, any type of concrete. Yes, we use the slump test. Comparison results from anywhere is possible. Even somebody working in UK can compare the results from India. It's fantastic, no issues. So as such, when we look at the slum test, which has dominated the uh, construction industry, time tested, 100 years or 120 years, used throughout in the codes and guidelines, used in all specification, most of the things, and abundant advantages that what we have in using this. Yes, slum test makes the measurement of our property by slum test, one has to accept without any murmur. So this is the scenario that what we have today. Let us look into the deeply into the slum test. Slum is used commercially all over the world. And of course, uh, it is a one predominant test that we consider for all types of uh, concretes. Let us look into, let us understand what a slum test is. 
let us come to the limitations of Islam. Yes, universality is accepted. Everybody says, yes, we have to go by Islam. Test. Let us deeply look into, very critically look into what we get from the Islam test. The first limitation. The slump test is not suitable for low workability. Zero slump. For example, I have seen, I have shown three pictures there. The first one, 300 kg per meter cube is a cement and the water is 115 liters per meter cube. The slump is zero. In the second picture, I have shown 300 kg, that's the cement used. Water has been increased to 130 liters per meter cube. Again, the slump is zero. In the bottom picture, Cement is again then maintained 300 constant. Water is 145 liters per meter cube. Again, the slump is zero. So, in all the three, the mixed ingredients are different. Even though cement may be same, but water is different. So, mixing ingredient is different. But still, the slump test is showing as zero slump. So, one of the first deficiency that we have in slump test is that slump test fails to differentiate the mixed composition for stiff mixes. So whenever we encounter any stiff mixes, we cannot use the slump test to measure the workability because it gives for different mix ingredients of stiff mixes, it gives the same result where we cannot compare the results. So first drawback of the slump test is that it fails to differentiate the mix composition for very stiff mixes. Let us look into the second drawback. The second limitation of the slump test is concrete with different composition have the same slump. For example, in the first picture, where I have the first uh, top picture I've used for normal concrete, and the bottom is for SEC. Cement is 300 kg, water is 160, slump is uh, 20 mm. I'll not uh, read the units. Uh, cement 450, water 150, slump is again 20. So here the cement is in the first case 300, second case is 450, water is 160 and 150, but still the slump is 20. Same thing happens in case of SEC also, where the powder. We talk in terms of powder as far as SEC is concerned because uh, um, we have the limitation in using uh, <clears throat> the high uh, cement content. For example, for doing SEC, the total powder, when we talk about the powder, it is a combination of cement and then the filler material or the millet mixture there. It should be at least starting from, for, say, 600 to Eight, 750 or 800. Sometimes we today we are talking in terms of lower one where it can be done even at 300 to uh, 450 or 500. So it's called as a smart dynamic concrete from commercial angle. Let us not look into that particular thing. There are other issues are there as far as smart dynamic concrete is concerned. As far as SEC is concerned, we need more of powder for it to lubricate the aggregates for the flowability. As such, in the powder is 550, the first one, what is 185 and SP used is 0.5%. Port is 580 and water is increased 195 and then SP is slightly increased 0.6. Still, we are getting 700 mm. So, we have a situation where concrete with different compositions have the same slump. So, again, slump test fails to differentiate the mixes. So, there is a drawback or the deficiency is there as far as the slump test as far as the stiff mixes are concerned. And also, there is a deficiency in the slump test as far as the mixed composition of different mixes are concerned. This is another drawback that what we can see. The third drawback that we can see is the reproducibility of the test results is very poor. In fact, the reproducibility of the test is poor even when the concrete and the operator remains the same with results being questionable. Because today we, we may do some test, get some value. If you repeat this with the same mix and uh, mix design and then the same materials, if you do tomorrow, you may get a different uh, results. As such, the reproducibility is a question mark as far as the slum test is concerned. That's a third drawback that we can see in this case. And the fourth one, concrete with the same slum can exhibit different behavior when tapped with tamping rod. So if, if, depending upon the disturbance that you are going to impart, it may behave differently. In other words, from a static condition to dynamic condition, the behavior may be different, but still we are relying on the slump value there. The fifth limitation that I can put it is slump values are subjective assessment and values can be adjusted based on the requirement. In other words, the slump test can be manipulated. The results of the slump test can be too easily adjusted to meet the requirement and the test is vulnerable for manipulations. Somebody can manage this with using water or something else and get a particular slump. So in other words, even though it is a subjective assessment, at the same time, it has got a drawback that slump values can be adjusted or can be manipulated depending upon the requirement. Some of the other uh, <clears throat> limitations that I can point out is this. Slump test is static and not dynamic 
and the results are influenced by time dependent property of course time dependent property is a larger issue where exotropy is a larger issue so that is there for our more most of the test living apart that particular thing static condition to dynamic condition the behavior is different same some value of harsh mix with less powder or paste may fall apart and the same may not be with a cohesive mix that is another point that we have got depending upon the vibration that we are going to put different operators may achieve significantly different plums with the same concrete under similar circumstances so it again depends on the person who is going to do that particular test it in other words the person who uh, conduct the test or can also influence the results slum test may not be suitable for all types of materials so for example in case of fiber reinforced concrete i have got my own uh, limitations as far as using this slum test is uh, the test does not provide an indication of the ease with which the concrete can be moved under dynamic placing conditions such as vibration so in other words when we look at the limitations of the slum test what we can finally say is that the test seems to be of little help in decision making for the use in field practice or the field applications slum test is not based on basic material science approach and not a test to be relied for a fundamental approach when we are talking in terms of the forces that is involved in the behavior of uh, flow of concrete concrete with a high microfines content may appear to be stiff and unworkable when observed in a static condition may go with a, a different thing when it is vibrated the lack of viable concrete workability test method has given way to reluctance in concrete industry in specifying non standard materials so today we are in a domain where we use lot of materials for concrete but standard tests are not there associated with that type of materials there is a reluctance in standardizing that because it is specific to the materials that we out there going to use we don't have the test to measure that particular thing the test results are subjective assessment which can have disagreement among persons involved about the exact meaning of the workability workability itself is a vague sense as such it may differ from person to person or it may depend depending upon the ground zero condition one may differ with uh, somebody's argument the slum test is less, less relevant for newer advanced concrete mixes than for more conventional mixes whereas workability is a broadly defined term the slum test measures only one aspect of workability namely the consistency other aspect of workability are commonly described as subjective terms so when we look at the the conditions that what we are in today even though transformation has taken place in concrete the test method to measure the workability has not changed whatever that changes that has taken place in concrete we are not reflecting in measuring the test so that's uh, the unfortunate thing that what we are in so let us look into what are the different levels of assessment we can broadly classify this into three levels level 1 subjective assessment one can by observation you can say it is a stiff stiff mix harsh mix like that some words can be used the second level is the quantitative numerical scale based on an empirical measurement like a single parameter for example slum test is an empirical test where we try to simulate the field condition by observing some value for example in case of slum test we measure the vertical distance in case of vb consistometer we measure the time in other words it is a single parameter test empirical test or single parameter test where one single parameter will define about the workability of the mix the third important is that in terms of the physical constant based on science derived from the fundamental science approach two parameters can be derived in other words when we look at the level of the assessment level of the fresh concrete slum test can be in the second level where we assign a numerical value based on the observation that is an empirical test maybe the distance the vertical subsidence that is a distance where that is not sufficient to describe the flow property of the fresh concrete we need to go for level 3 wherein we need to go in terms of physical constant based on the fundamental science approach slum test is now viewed as incapable of providing an adequate characterization of the workability of today's much more advanced concrete mixtures that's obvious because it is a single parameter test and if i compare with some of the other empirical tests more or less the same similarly other common tests like compaction factor vb flow table etc are also empirical tests where they measure only one single parameter if we look at the history of uh, the test methods and other things in 1928 36 40 smith power and popovics are pointed out the limitations of empirical test the limitations of this slum test is not new even 1928 itself they pointed out that there are some serious drawbacks as far as the slum test is concerned maybe pertaining to the advancement that has taken place in those days 
in 1983 that's a turning point in uh, the rheology of concrete in 1983 tatarshel argued that slum test is a single point test and advocated the fundamental science approach so that's a turning point in rheology of concrete wherein he strongly advocated in 1983 that whatever the test that we are doing is a empirical test where it gives only one parameter we need to have at least two parameters based on fundamental science approach in other words what are the forces that is involved in getting the flow properties of the concrete based on that one should argue out that and he made the argument and from then on lot of things have taken place and lot of uh, people started working on rheology of concrete so in a nutshell slum test is an empirical test so also other tests what we see in uh, uh, many of the codes and guidelines slum test is a single point test so also all other empirical test the slum test was developed at a time when water content was directly related to both strength and workability obviously one of the factors that abraham said located is that uh, the for the strength water to cement ratio is the one concept that we have to look into at the same time water can also be used for getting the consistency so as such the relationship between water content and the strength and workability are no longer as simple as they were once with newer materials so when he advocated that it was only four ingredient concept today we are talking the multiple ingredient concept as such that relevance of that particular concept may not hold good today with the newer materials so where do we stand today slum test has got limitations yes there are serious limitations are there as far as slum test is concerned viewed as incapable of providing an adequate characterization of the workability of today's much more advanced concrete mixtures yes what is needed is we need to look at a test which is robust which is which can measure the workability which should be simple relevant accurate economical and most importantly based on fundamental principles of science in other words you should talk in terms of the forces that is involved in the flow property of concrete so what could be the answer answer could be rheology of concrete by providing a scientific description of the fundamental flow properties of cement paste or mortar or concrete rheology represents a useful method of characterizing the concrete workability so from almost 100 years dominance of the slum test today we are questioning to some extent the suitability of that slum test so we need to go for a more scientifically based test which can measure the different compositions of the concrete in a better way so the answer could be the rheology of concrete so the question that comes here the slum test is is it too old or obsolete what can be the answer is it yes or no i will say yes as well as no the reason is this the slum test is too old yes of course 120 years old is it obsolete no it is not obsolete as of now because we don't have an alternative test method even though rheology has entered into the domain of concrete uh, field la larger in the larger area it has not penetrated lot of limitations has got there one one has to go for some more Uh, research on that and finally come to the field as such as of now we may not be in a position to authentically replace the slum test by rheological methods but definitely they are working on that many uh, countries they are already switched over to the rheological methods so as such i'll say both yes sir as well as no yes it is old but may not be obsolete as of now rheology is a science that seeks to characterize the flow and deformation of materials using fundamental principles of shear stress and shear weight so in other words rheology is based on the deformation it, it characterizes the flow properties of the material and it is based on the shear stress and shear rate of course uh, how it has been uh, that name has got from germany and other things let us not look into this so let us come to the rheology of fresh concrete if we look at the rheology of fresh concrete it characterizes the flow property so workability is related to flow property of concrete so as such if we want to apply the rheology to concrete we need to relate the workability to the flow property of concrete fresh concrete is considered as a fluid consisting of cement paste and aggregate phase two phase system three phase system it is if i take out that two phase system it is a combination of your uh, 
cement paste as well as the aggregate phase. So as such, we can consider that as a fluid because cement paste will viscous liquid. The aggregates are there in viscous liquid. In other words, fresh concrete is a concentrated suspension of solid particles. There is an aggregate in viscous liquid that is cement paste. And cement paste itself is a concentrated suspension of cement grains in water. So as such, when we look at the concrete, fresh concrete, we can always relate the workability to the flow property of the concrete because we can consider the concrete as a fluid. So the question will come. So once we can relate that as a fluid, can we, is it required for us to go for different models? Not necessary. We can always borrow from fluid rheology. Fluid rheology is a well-established science, widely used science that is directly applicable to the workability of fresh concrete. In other words, whatever the models, whatever the understanding, whatever the theories that has been put forth by fluid rheology, we can borrow from that for you can use it for concrete. The relationship between shear stress and shear rate are represented graphically in a flow curve. There are different models are there that models can be graphically represented by means of a flow curve. So rheology provides an objective and a quantitative assessment of fresh concrete based on the fundamental science approach. And what is the use of that? It is cost effective. It can have a better production, quality control, and most important, use of new marginal materials, which is which was not there in case of convention concrete, where the slump test cannot differentiate that. But today, by using rheological properties or rheological test methods, one can always go for new as well as the marginal materials. So the main objective of rheology is to predict the fluid flow based on fundamental principles of shear stress and shear rate. In other words, we are going to conduct the test on concrete and find out shear stress and shear rate based on the flow curves, we can get the rheological properties of concrete. Let us look into some of the history of that, how it has been generated and things. Ricci work in 1930 was the first who attempted to define the flow of concrete by associating it with various effects such as bleeding, sedi sedimentation and density. That is the thing. Later on, Powers and Wheeler developed a coaxial um, cylinder rotational viscometer and then further Tatarshell independently carried out experiment using these coaxial cylinder viscometers. In other words, if I look at all these things, there was a method from 1930 onwards, there was an attempt to go in for geological properties of the concrete, looking at the deficiencies of the slump test or the empirical test. Most important, Tatarshell and then Banfield in 1983 argued that the empirical test or single point test and suggested quantitative fundamental science approach for characterizing the fresh concrete. They assumed the fresh concrete as a non neutering fluid and determined the rheological properties by using two point test apparatus. In fact, Tata Shell developed a two point uh, rheometer to measure the rheological properties and uh, its uh, starting point was 1983. Let us look into some of the models and then the equations that is developed. The constitute equations regarded as a mathematical models of material bodies, which is based on principles of continuum mechanism. Various constitute equations have been developed to idealize as a flow curve. Measures the rheological properties, parameters of the properties by using these equations or the flow curves. And also, one can establish the two physical re relation between two physical quantities, the shear stress and shear rate, and then using this one can one can establish a graph based on that one can get the rheological pr properties let us look into some other curves there equations are represented in the form of flow curves graphically among them six curves have been developed in uh, fluid rheology or the accepted one the bingham herschel balke kasson newtonian power law both shear thickening and shear thinning among this the Bingham model is accepted by many researchers as the appropriate for fresh properties. Most of the researchers, they talk in terms of rheological properties using the Bingham model. In other words, the Bingham curve or the graphically it is represented by means of shear stress versus shear rate. And Bingham model is the one which is generally accepted for concrete. Bingham model is a linear approximation of shear stress and shear rate relationship of a material or a fluid. So we are treating concrete as a fluid. So it is a linear relation between shear stress and then shear rate. Most of the researchers agree that the fresh concrete behaves like a Bingham uh, fluid. Many fluid possesses some minimum stress. It is called as a yield stress that must be exceeded before the flow occurs. And the concept of yield stress is very readily seen in case of a concrete slump. When we lift the Abraham's comb, uh, initially the concrete starts flowing. At some stage it stops. When the 
force of gravity is more when it is more than the yield stress concrete flows when it is when the subsidence takes place when the force of gravity is less than the yield stress it stops in other words the concrete will have the minimum yield stress materials that exhibit a yield stress are considered to be viscoelastic material and the bingham model incorporates a yield stress fresh concrete is described by two material parameters yield stress and plastic viscosity if you look at this particular graph it is a relation between shear stress and shear rate and using this bingham uh, model of the equation or the graph the y intercept is called as the yield stress and the slope of this is called as a plastic viscosity in other words by using the relation between shear stress and shear rate we can get two parameters one the yield stress another one is the plastic viscosity yield stress is the y intercept of the relation between shear stress and shear rate and the slope of that line is the your plastic viscosity coming back to this bingham model bingham model represents a linear relation between stress acting to shear the concrete and the rate of shear yield stress is the stress required to initiate the material flow lower the yield stress means higher the flow plastic viscosity is a measure of a material's resistance to flow once the flow is initiated the higher the viscosity the higher is the material's resistance to flow and viscosity being the slope and the y intercept is the yield stress in other words the yield stress and plastic viscosity yield stress is nothing but the stress required to initiate the material flow plastic viscosity is nothing but the material's resistance once the, uh, the initiation of the flow occurs this is very important this uh, this is how uh, the rheology importance can be understood i have shown the bingham model in the first one where it is a relation between shear stress and shear rate as i told you earlier that y intercept is nothing but the yield stress and the slope is nothing but the plastic viscosity i have shown below two same relation same material one particular mix may have rather the two uh, mixes may have the same yield stress that is a single parameter but they may differ as well as the plastic viscosity is concerned or two mixes may have the same slope that is a plastic viscosity but they may differ as far as the yield stress is concerned or the y intercept is concerned as such this is very important here because of the two parameters one can differentiate the mixes for example the one of the limitations of the sum test is that for very stiff mixes we don't get the uh, comparison whereas here since it is based on bingham model is based on or the rheology of concrete is based on two parameters the yield stress and plastic viscosity by looking at two parameters one can differentiate the mixes in the first go both mixes may have the same yield stress but definitely they may have a different yield stress so one can always differentiate based on i'm sorry the plastic viscosity the mixes may have the same plastic viscosity but definitely they may have a different yield stress one can always differentiate the two different mixes you looking at the yield stress in other words looking at two values two parameters yield stress and plastic viscosity one can differentiate the mixes which is not the luxury as far as the slum test is concerned and aci 238 ir 08 2008 recommends for better understanding and measuring the workability of fresh concrete is by rheological technique It is there in 2008 itself rheology provides scientific description for flow properties of concrete it will provide the workability of concrete by two point parameters so in other words when compared to the empirical test which is a single parameter test in rheological uh, concept we get two parameters which is better way of describing the test not only that it is based on the scientific approach so rheometer is a device to measure the shear stress at varying shear rates so what are the instruments that we use for measuring the rheological properties of concrete so one of the most important is the rheometer rheometer is a device which measures the shear stress at varying shear rates by getting the values of shear stress at different shear rates one can plot the shear stress versus shear rate and get the bingham parameters or two parameters yield stress and plastic viscosity commonly two methods are used for rheological measurements one is a capillary method and one is a rotational method in capillary method the test sample is made to flow through a narrow tube as a result of applied force and in rotational method the test sample is continuously sheared between two surfaces one or both of which are rotating any one method is used but uh, of most important in concrete we use rotational method so not much is used as far as the capillary tube is concerned so rotational rheometers are better than capillary tube device because in measurement of viscosity 
and distribution of the shear rate and shear stress is more precise in case of rotational rheometers. The rotational rheometers can be divided further into three main categories, coaxial cylinder, parallel plate, and then cone and plate type of rheometers. I've shown uh, the method how it is uh, sheared, the coaxial one, the parallel plate one, impeller one. It's only the different types of how it is going, is going to be sheared. Based on that, the name has been given. The rheometer is a device used to measure the shear stress at varying shear rates. Of course, one instrument that can be used is the rheometer. How we are going to measure this? Based on the flow curve test. A flow curve test is performed by shearing the concrete at different shear rates and measuring the resistance to flow. In most cases, a constant high rate of shear is initially applied to bring the sample to reference state to normalize the effect of thixotrophy on the measure shear stresses. The reason why they use a very high shear rate in case of rheometers is to bring down the thixotrophic effect to balance that and then take the readings. The shear rate is then decreased in increments and the corresponding shear stress values are recorded. Once you have the shear stress and shear rates, you can always plot shear stress versus shear rate uh, plot. Plot of shear stress versus uh, shear rate will give the two Bingham parameters, that is yield stress and then plastic viscosity. So in uh, market, there are plenty of rheometers are there. The Tertial 2 point, BML viscometer, IBB rheometer, like that many, many things are there. I've shown only about a uh, few of them. Today, it's almost more than 40 to 50 rheometers are there in uh, the market. So, rheometers can give us two important parameters, the yield stress and plastic viscosity. So, the question will come, are we at the answer? No. Rheometer, even though rheometer is there in the market, it has got its own limitations. Most of the rheometers are not suitable for stiff and low workability concretes. Again, there is a problem in the rheometer. It may not be suitable for stiff and low workability mixes, but it may be suitable for a particular range of mixes where it can differentiate the mixes, which is not the case in case of slump test, where the slump of two mixes of the same value will not differentiate the mixes. Whereas here, with the, within the bandwidth, definitely they can differentiate the mixes there. Some may address available to measure, but require to change the configurations. So for different uh, um, ingredients, it may have to change the configurations. That is another thing. It is difficult to perform all types of concrete mixes in a single rheometer. One can argue out the slump test can be used for any type of uh, concrete mixes. Agreed. But they have got their own limitations. Blindly, we are using that. Whereas here also, there is some difficulty in using the rheometer for all types of concrete. We need to change the configurations. In addition to that, there are some more limitations are there. Rheometers are mostly typically used exclusively in the laboratory. And very few rotational rheometers have been designed to be sufficiently small and rugged for use on the job site, but are costly. So another drawback that goes for the rheometers is that most of the rheometers that have been developed are laboratory confined because they're quite bulky. So when they're quite bulky, nobody would like to take it to the site and then use it. The reason why the slump test has become so popular is because of its simplicity. Just one can just take a Abraham's cone and go to the field and then do it. Whereas in case of areometers, most of the areometers which have come earlier, they're quite bulky. As such, they're confined only to the laboratory stage. And most important, they're costly. Whereas uh, uh, earlier, the cost of the areometers, suppose if you go with the Indian rupees, is somewhere around 20 lakhs like that. Today, of course, it has come down to 8, 9 lakhs. When compared to the slump test or the Abraham's cone, the cost of Abraham's cone is nothing. So as such, even today, whenever some instrument has to be accepted in the field, two things that goes with that. One, it should be simple. The second one, it should be cheap. At the same time, it should be available. So as such, many people will not use this because it is rugged. It is very quite bulky. You know, they don't want to use this. So that's a drawback of this. So that's a drawback that what we are seeing in case of rheometers. In addition to that, the dead zone, the wall effect, the slippage, those problems are there in rheometers. When it is sheared, some of the concrete will go to the end, and as such, it creates a dead zone there. As such, that dead zone, that concrete will not be sheared in that particular area. Attempts are made successfully to develop portable type rotation rheometers that are rugged and have met some success. Yes, today we are in the domain where portable rheometers have come into the domain. Uh, Fowler and Kohler have developed this from University of Texas in Austin. They have developed this, it is portable. But the question is again, the cost. Cost is very high. So as such, again, 
um, many people, may, even though it may be a portable rheometer, they may not use it because of the cost. Most important thing that comes out uh, against the rheometers is this. Ferraris from US carried out the test on the same sample. He, what she did was, in the research, she took about five rheometers, different types of rheometers, and she used the same mixes for all the rheometers and compiled the results. When they saw at the age stress and plasticity, there are a lot of differences was there. As such, one of the other important uh, limitations that go against the rheometer is that the different test method which measures the age stress and plasticity may not concur with that. That's another problem. It goes with the individual uh, uh, instrument. In addition to that, uh, there are some more observations by Faiz and Kayat where uh, they show that the same mixes shows different age stress and plasticity values among the different types of rheometers in addition to Faraday's. In other words, there is no concurrence in the rheological values measured by different rheometers. So again, there is, uh, there is an answer at the same time we don't have the answer. So again, there are some limitations are there. Of course, they are working on this particular thing. So in a summary, as far as rheometers are concerned, despite these limitations, Concrete rheometers do provide important information about concrete flow properties. Even though it may have its own limitations, each individual instrument, it can give an important information about two parameters used for describing the flow behavior of concrete, is stress and plastic viscosity, and that is based on scientific approach, which is more reliable than the empirical test like some tests. There is a need to study the flow properties of Uh, Giri sir, Giri sir, sorry to interrupt. I think uh, your this thing is muted, sir. Uh, your microphone is muted. Your mic is muted, sir. You have to unmute and speak. Uh, are you audible, sir? Yeah, yes, no. Sir. Yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sorry to interrupt. interrupt. No problem. Okay. Okay, uh, coming back to this uh, rheometer, yes, there is a need to study the flow properties of fresh concrete at low shear rate uh, under static conditions and to overcome the limitations of the rheometers. From this angle, uh, of course, uh, they have pointed out uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, different types of rheometers. I think I'll skip this because already time is up. I'll go to this concrete shear box. Where well, this is the one we have fabricated the first time. We are looking at the limitations of the um, rheometers, where the they shear the concrete at a very high shear rate and then measure the shear stress and shear rate. One of the drawbacks is that concrete will never experience that type of shear rate in practice. So we thought that can we not uh, going for a static test as far as uh, <clears throat> the rheological properties are concerned. So we developed a new instrument, concrete shear box in BMS College of Engineering, along with uh, Dr. Ravi Ranganath. And we are using this uh, instrument to measure the rheological properties successfully. In fact, uh, Dr. Ajay has done his PhD on uh, using this uh, concrete shear box. Um, and uh, I'll just point out uh, some of the results. Of course, a lot of uh, mixes we have done, but I'd like to point out uh, for the mix M1 to roughly about M9, where nine mixes, if you look at the slump value, that is a vertical slump, it is almost zero. So 5.3, we can ignore that. So from mix M1 to M9, we have got zero slump. But the mixes are totally different. Whereas in the M1, it is 300, M2, 375, 450, and water is 115 for these three mixes. Whereas in the second four to six, the water used is 130, and 79 is 140. In other words, M1 to M9 are totally, the ingredients are totally different. As such, from the vertical uh, slum, rather the slum test, from the vertical subsidence, we got the almost zero value. So we cannot compare. We cannot say based on the slum test, we cannot differentiate the mixes. But when you look at the test conducted based on concrete shear box, we got different values for this. In other words, 
Concrete shear box very clearly differentiates the mixes based on the mix ingredients, mix ingredients. But that is not the case in case of a slump test. This is as far as the conventional concrete is concerned or the normal concrete is concerned. Similarly, we have done that. Uh, he has done a lot of tests uh, using SEC also, where I'd like to point out M22 and 23, where the slump flow is 750, whereas the uh, same thing, even though it is 300 and then GGBS, that's the filler that we have used is different. Total powder is different. In the first one, it is 579 kg per meter cube. Second one is 637 kg per meter cube for 22 and then 23 mixes, uh, M22 and M23 mixes. It's where the flow is 750, the loan flow is 750, whereas uh, when you look at the instance, it is slightly different. So as such, the rheological properties are going to stay here because whatever the uh, limitations, what are the drawbacks that we are seeing in case of uh, um, slump test or the empirical test in general has to be taken care of. To some extent, rheological properties can take care of that. Only thing is final refinement has to take place as far as the instrument is concerned and other methods are concerned. But definitely, rheology of concrete is a one where definitely it is going to be the out of the day. And let us look at some of the applications here. Um, uh, of course, from 1983 onwards, they started working on this. Today, in some of the countries, they started using this rheological concept for field application also. And for example, if I take, for example, segregation. In many concrete applications, increased flowability facilitates placing and finishing. Absolutely no issues. Increased uh, uh, flowability always helps in uh, placing and finishing. But increasing the flowability beyond a particular limit can result in segregation. That's the problem. So yield stress is a key rheological parameter to ensure adequate segregation resistance. At the same time, higher plastic viscosity can slow down the segregation. So one can have a combination of these two to take care of the segregation. So in design combination, if low yield stress is designed for a mix, then one can prefer a higher viscosity to minimize the segregation effects. As such, since we are going to get two parameters from the rheological properties of concrete, one can always balance these two, combine these two, so that segregation can be addressed to some extent. Second application I can look into is this about the pumping. Blockage can happen during startup. That can be due to non-pumpable uh, problem in the mix design or inappropriate uh, selection or preparation of the pump line or lack of inadequate priming, those things are there. But there is, let us say, there is there can be a blockage during startup or there can be change in the excessive pressure during pumping. There can be change in the pressure there. High flow rates, small pipes or inappropriate rheological properties of the concrete, it can happen. So observation is that the lower viscosity requires lower pumping uh, pressure. Design, for example, it designed a lower viscosity and a lower pumping pressure for a mix. Suddenly the pumping increases, pressure increases, then it indicates that the yield stress or the flow decreases. Yield stress increases. In that, the remedy can be decrease the viscosity or decrease the yield stress or the increases from. So as such, rheological properties can always be looked into for applications wise, we can immediately, quickly, we can take a decision about that, how to manage this and then we can go ahead with that particular thing as such. So when we look at the uh, century old uh, slum test or the empirical test, today's concrete, uh, it, those tests may not be suitable for today's concrete. The alternative is to go for a uh, more scientifically based or uh, fundamentally approached physical constraints in the form of uh, yield stress and plastic study or generalize it as rheological parameters. And are we in a position to totally transform it to rheological properties may not be possible because of uh, the drawbacks at what we see in the instrument. Slowly it is, uh, the gap is uh, slowing down and many places they are using uh, a particular type of rheometer and only coating that particular thing. To generalize that, there needs to be some more uh, um, work has to take place. But definitely rheology is going to be the answer for the limitations that what we see in case of a single parameter test. So the relevance of rheological uh, properties of the fresh concrete, it can be used for quality control, it can be used for pumping of the concrete, one can look into this friction and pressure against the formwork surfaces, vibration and compaction of concrete, mixed as in based on rheological properties. So benefits can be better quality of the mix, reduced cost, effective use of material, effective control of quality of the mix, and hence the hardened properties, use of newer and marginal materials, and many more. So this is the advantage that what we are going to have by going in for a scientific uh, description of the flow property of concrete.
so these are the references i have abundantly used uh, for my uh, presentation and uh, coming to the last slide i'm i hope uh, that uh, i brought you to the doorstep of rheology house definitely i have not given any information about the entering the rheology house but i have given a basic information wherein the importance of rheology i uh, tried to touch upon in other words i made this person to stand near the door of uh, the rheology house thank you sir they can ask they can go for questions thank you sir thank you sir wonderful session non stop you are giving uh, very good ideas about the concrete and uh, it was very interesting session uh, now it is audience uh, please if you have any questions you can ask sir you can write the queries if your uh, mic is not working you can write otherwise you can speak uh, unmute and speak also not an issue request audience uh asfia she is from pwd department she has mentioned she has complimented you with a nice session thank you thank you madam yeah you can write here i will share the feedback form also you can write your feedbacks or if you have any questions you can write on that also so that we will convey to the presenter ex pritham kumar has mentioned excellent session jagdish singh uh, mentioned nice session sir thank you thank you sir let us see for 2 minutes and we will uh, wind up sir of course i confess that uh, rheology is a new concept in india yeah yeah <laughs> it is a new term to everyone yeah. uh, new word new word deepak thinker has mentioned a uh, very excellent uh, ashok uh, yeah. uh, if you don't mind i, I would like to uh, <laughs> ask a couple of uh, you know my please, doubts please sir please sir, uh, please, uh, sir uh, thank you for the excellent presentation i'm very sorry thank you sir for asking <laughs> right from the beginning uh, sir i i just i just wanted to know how do you see rheology translating into indian context not only in terms of concrete but uh, you know we all we all know this is an issue related to mortar and concrete i mean related products yeah. of mm -hmm. cement so how how do you see it in in the near future and also in the long run no, basically uh, if you if you look at the indian condition of course iit is uh, in bombay they are working on this and manasantanam is excellent uh, work a lot of iits they are doing on this and some of the major companies they are looking into this rheological models or predicting the flow behavior and because that gives them the most important advantage of using newer materials and the cost cost effectiveness mm -hmm. i see that uh, once it opens out the domain definitely we can see uh, maybe another 5 to 10 years already some of the countries there kamal kayath and other places us they are already using this in the field okay it's not an issue only thing is the cost wise the rheometers are quite costly because suppose if somebody says that i want 30 lakhs means nobody will give 30 lakhs so that's a problem there so that's the reason why we are trying to going for can we reduce the cost by portable means or by portable uh, instrument or by some other means for example direct shear box is nothing but an extension of your um, shear box in uh, geotechnical uh, this so that we have modified that for to be used in concrete so like that we can always look into that so that's a domain where if somebody can venture into lot of things opens out so any for example uh, when i go to this uh, development of acc in uh, sir compact in concrete in 1984 that idea was tossed up to the industry people okay. within 4 years they were able to come up with lot of uh, testing methods and then uh, feedback like that the test have come up even here also we need to go for different types of things we can modify uh, go for a different type of thing so that you can get two parameters so that that can definitely describe about the flow property of concrete so that is you need to open out this in indian yeah. scenario also uh thank you sir sir uh, actually uh, vivian is there vivian is asking what is the influence of heat stress and plastic viscosity uh, vivian can you be little more specific uh, if you could come online or uh, you want sir to answer vivian okay sir you can you can answer in fact uh, what is the influence of yield stress and plastic viscosity that's what i told you the application wise application wise it again depends on the mixing gradients that is not reflected in your slum test this is reflected here you can always gamble with the ingredients there you can okay. always try there 
So again, we can have a combination of field stress and then plastic viscosity. For example, when we use uh, SCC in case of uh, site, we use viscosity modifying admixture to take yeah. care of the changes that is going to be there in the grading or the moisture. But by using viscosity modifying agrees, you are reducing the strength. So those concepts, we can always have a combination between heat stress and plastic viscosity and manage that without going uh, in for a, a third, uh, uh, one more ingredient which influences your uh, other properties. Uh, so just to follow up question, I I was I was I was a little curious to know uh, since you mentioned generally in concrete what we use are uh, inert aggregates we don't expect uh, more of a water absorption and other other you know uh, uh, other uh, what do you say troublesome uh, properties but uh, let us take a case where we use some recycled materials or to a greater extent where water absorption is actually a phenomena which would definitely influence the water absorption characteristics and therefore. How rheology can help us, you know, technically, because this more scientific way of, you know, finding this, out. This, this is a wonderful thing, especially CND waste. Yeah, exactly. That's, waste. Waste. that's, that's a vulnerable pro problem that what we face in uh, doing the concreting. Correct. This can definitely talk in terms of that. So you can look into these values, definitely can use this uh, heat stress and plasticity and come out with uh, uh, what are the different uh, thing that you can go look into as far the whites are concerned. You can relate that with this. You can do that. So, because it reflects whatever that is there inside, it reflects based on fundamental approach. Okay. So, you can relate to voids there. Suppose if you are not using uh, unprocessed, let us say, CND, it's not processed, unprocessed. We can always take advantage of that. So, radiological properties can be an answer for that. Yeah. So, uh, so in a nutshell, like scientifically, even yeah, uh, considering yeah, the uncertainties involved in the in the raw materials, we can use this approach as a foolproof approach, like virtually. Yes. To monitor yeah. the the fresh properties of concrete. Yes. Uh, thank yes. you very much, sir. That was that was an excellent uh, uh, excellent concept. Um, anybody else uh, would like to know uh, more about uh, the the concept, or should we should we go ahead with uh, you know thanking him? Ashok, is there anybody who would like to know anything anything more about this? Uh, no, no more question. Vivian, yes, I could not able to. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Not, uh, he's not able to use the microphone, so he is. Anyways, he is, is told thank you, which means I assume, presume he has understood. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, what Hello. Is Sir, some of yes, the questions sir. there here, some Deepak, how it can be implemented? He has uh, uh, passed some questions. Deepak, how it can be implemented? Now, what needs to be implemented? Uh, maybe yeah. Riyaji. The concepts of rheology, I think, as far as field application, let us assume that way. And that is, I've given the two applications, example for segregation and then uh, pumping. pumping. That can okay. always be done. Okay. And another question he also asked that, where is methodology adapted now? Where, where is, is methodology is adapted? Yeah, yeah in, the, in many countries, they're using these rheological models for uh, designing the mix and also using that in the field. It's already there in the field. It may not be in India. So, Ashok, uh, can we go ahead and conclude? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Please, yeah, sir. Yeah. Please, so, uh, sir. So, thank you, uh, Professor Giri, sir. Uh, it's it's really you now wonderful and thought provoking to listen to you. Um, it's been many days, honestly. Uh, uh, and and uh, you are at, at your best as usual. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining. And, and and I saw I could see like about more than 70, 75 people at one point in time. Most of them are actually, you know, congratulating you for this thought provoking session. And most of them have even uh, expressed their willingness to uh, get a hold of the PT and video. I, I hope you're going to share. I mean, Ashok is going to share uh, in some time. But anyways, uh, I would like to uh, thank the speaker, Dr. Girish, and uh, our co-host, uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar, uh, for obliging us on behalf of Rasta uh, to host this webinar. And you know, uh, of course, all participants who have uh, who have actually joined us for this enlightening session on uh, rheology. Um, uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for your time and efforts. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, as usual, you have obliged us uh, on our request. Uh, and you have committed your time to us. Thank you so much for time uh, for joining in. And I also thank Dr. Ajay 
for facilitating this uh, and and thank thank you thank you everybody i should thank uh, ashok kumar i should thank uh, ashin joshi i should thank uh, dr ajay i should thank rasta i should thank all the participants thank you sir it's a pleasure to be with you people thank you sir thank you sir thank we'll you. look forward to for such more wonderful session thank you sir. thank you very much thank you bye